Yeah, so this is going to be great. And we are live. Welcome, folks, uh, to FMA Discussion. This is episode 191, and today we are featuring Guru Darcy. And uh, folks, if you're tuning in, tell us where you're watching from. And today we're going to be covering a wide range of his journey. But we're also going to get into his survival tactics, uh, wild foods and medicine, his kettlebell training, and how that can enhance us as practitioners. Uh, kind of looking outside the lens as far as, uh, you know, developing our attributes and improving upon them. So we're going to get into all this good stuff. So I want to thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Oh, I'm so grateful to be on here. It's uh, it's actually quite an honor after seeing just some of the episodes full of amazing FMA practitioners and just martial arts, martial artists in general. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's funny. When I, when I developed this, um, it'll be two years Right before COVID, so it was, it'll be two years late October. So the so the beginning, the, the whole platform was you know we'll bring the community together, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, and uh, but it was really to get the people that you know maybe that don't have the huge huge names but are doing great stuff. So I've always made a point not to just get big names on there. Like if you look at the list of people I've had on there, they're not all big name people. Um, you know, I just you know I, the people that maybe never had the opportunity to be heard and all that but deserve it and that's and then definitely you know getting women i definitely want the women to be heard and that's you know we're getting there it's been a struggle but more and more starting to do it more and more feeling more comfortable about coming on and sharing their stuff but so those have been the real goals and um you know um i've had some big names on as as you know but I, to me I, I hope this doesn't go the wrong way out there I find the lesser known people more fascinating, <clears throat> like what they've done. Oh, yeah, I do. 100%. Like my most interesting interviews, like if you look at Mike Belzer from last night, like yeah. they have a huge name, but that guy, that was off the chain with the, what that guy was talking about. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> you know, so it's, yeah, so I don't know, that's what fits me. But some people are like, oh, you, you, you're getting such and such on. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, see now I'm gonna I'm gonna get messages after this. See, <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you will. <laughs> yeah, you know. But uh, all right, folks, if you're watching, tell us where you're watching from and smash that like button. We're gonna jump right into it. So, um, you know, looking you up and all that. I mean, you quite it sounds like a diverse, diverse background. So before we jump into the FMA. You know, what, what was your initial training in uh, martial arts? I mean, uh, it sounds like you had a significant Thai background in um, mixed martial arts. So what say you? Um, well, you know, it's uh, I didn't actually start going to train in a, in a dojo setting or a gym setting until 2008. Um, so a relatively, relatively recent. But um I put in the hours immediately because I wanted to I wanted to fight mixed martial arts. And that's why I actually had started going to the gym. Mm -hmm. um, so I was in there every single day, two to three hours a day, going to multiple gyms, um, just soaking up whatever I could with no real direction other than just trying to fill the holes, the gaps that I felt that I had mm -hmm. that I noticed in sparring. Um, and that uh, that started off with a kickboxing under an instructor um, here in town uh, named Curtis Lee. And um, I was with him for maybe a year or so, and then moved on to another gym uh, called Zuma, um, which has got a number of really amazing instructors um, like uh, Adam Zuchek, um, Sarah Kaufman, uh, no old, old school UFC fighter, she was there or is there. Um, yeah, there's quite a few. I think Ryan Jane is instructing there also. Um, amazing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, great kickboxing. And I was there for quite a while too and then ended up um, kind of bouncing around between professional self-defense because there was a guy there teaching uh, really clean, like I think he called it submission wrestling. Okay. And uh, and it was, it was awesome. It was a real kind of fresh breath uh, as far as grappling for me because I liked his um, kind of aggressive approach um, maybe less uh, I mean I, I I am not a BGJ practitioner in the sense that I even go to a class once a week mm -hmm. so any of my terminologies um, 
might be too. I should just I just want to say that right now, so you have maybe some less emails to deal with later. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, I sure have seen that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I ended up I ended up kind of bouncing around between quite a few gyms for a while before um, Victoria Martial Arts started up, which used to be uh, the Curtis Lee um, place, and then. The, the fellow that started teaching there was actually one of Kersley's old students, but he had just, you know how some, we can all learn from the same person, the same thing, but some people just extract more out of the lesson. Sure. <clears throat> and, and Rob was very much that way. We had been training at Curtis's for about the same amount of time, but there was details to the instructions that I think that he picked up better than I did before I did, um, which was really cool. So, um, when he opened Victoria Martial Arts, he asked me if I wanted to come share kettlebell because that was one of those things I had a certification in. I'd spent a lot of time mm. in already. Um, so I did, and he was just building up the gym. So it was perfect just to get on the ground floor. And I'd take his classes. He'd, he'd take my classes. And just from that, like those little extra tidbits of instruction that he understood better than I did, I was able to kind of up my game and learn far more than our previous instructor could have actually you know, have taught us because of that. It was that uh, iron sharpens iron kind of idea. Yeah, yeah, mentality. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I loved it. So when you mentioned that, you know, um, you know, just going back when 2008, when you decided to get some formal training, like, what, I mean, were you, what were you doing before that? Were you kind of just self-experimentation or just, because um, 2008, you were, you must have been late 20s or thereabouts? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, uh, yeah, it was almost thirty at that point. Okay, so, um, so did you do anything prior to that, or is it, is it was it more like, hey, this is something I, I just I want to do? Or... I had a, I had an interesting uh, first few decades, and um, one of the aspects that was throughout those years uh, had to do with violence. Um, I probably got into, and I know this will set some people off, but I got into hundreds of fist fights, um, literally hundreds. And I, and I appreciate that a lot of people go through their lives without getting in a single fist fight. I didn't have the tools, um, as far as communication and emotional stability to even okay. back okay. away from fights until I was probably in my twenties, um, maybe even mid twenties. So I got into a crazy amount of fist fights uh, with high levels of violence. Um, I got stabbed uh, in the hand and multiple times. One time uh, I got stabbed in the back and the elbow. Another occasion I got my face slashed open. I got stabbed in the head multiple times with a bottle. Um, I had a number of different experiences that gave me stuff to reflect on that I could then learn mm -hmm. from. And because it was such a, because violence was always in my life in some capacity or another, I was always thinking ahead about the next fight, about the next um, violent, you know, Encounter. conflict. Yeah. And so that's what actually brought me to fighting MMA was I realized, you know, it was a place that I could go and I could train like that against people that were better than I was and learn more in a safe way that nobody really got hurt other than the people who agreed to it yeah. um, and that in turn really kind of gave me a place you know I, I never really stopped training after that yeah no it sounds like though it sounds like and i don't think this is should set anybody off i think you're you're raising it something that's really in my opinion is very important you know whether it's mma fma whatever whatever the art whatever the discipline or, or the uh, life choice you, you made a conscious effort to choose something to channel your emotions in a controlled oh, yeah. environment there's nothing like to me you took like you took a whole a whole of your life and all that and channeled it into an arena where to stop what was going on out there so i think that's completely i don't think anybody should say anything about that i think that's a reflection of of a conscious choice you made to improve your life and using martial arts to do that if anything i think it's a positive message i mean you could have obviously stayed in the lane you were in and probably end up in prison I'm, or, 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 or i'm guessing yeah you know what i yeah. mean um 
so yeah so i i think that i think there's a message there that's uh worthy so um so you're in this gym you're you know you're doing mma tie boxing all that um so you competed like some of the pictures i saw and, and all that uh how long did that how long did that go on for um, it was pretty short lived, really. Uh, I I had uh, had four fights over the course of a year or just under a year, and then I got into a major car accident that really messed me up for a while. Um, yeah, it's actually it was it was kind of brutal. I was just starting to get messages from different big promoters here in Canada asking me to come out and fight because I was not the most skilled fighter but I always put on a show. There was always blood. There was always, you know, a lot of mayhem and I'm covered in tattoos. People love that kind of stuff. So, you know, it was, uh, it was, yeah, I was getting some attention. And then um, I got in a car accident in Vancouver and it uh, yeah, it messed me up pretty bad. Like I got a dent in my head from it. Um, I couldn't touch my fingers properly like this, this kind of emotion without looking at it. That was you know, I, uh, I get frustrated from, um, talking too much because I just, my brain just couldn't like function fast enough. Okay. I, it took me, it took me about maybe about six months or a year before I started to feel kind of normal again after that. Um, but that, yeah, that kind of, that pulled me out of training, pulled me out of everything for, yeah, it was about a, about a year before I started doing a sort of, uh, contact sports and, um, then, yeah, then I got into it pretty much full bore, but by then the rules and everything had changed too and just didn't appeal to me the same. Because mm -hmm. when, I, when I was doing MMA, the, we didn't, we barely got, you know, blood tested. We almost didn't always do weigh-ins. Um, there was mm -hmm. often some cash put aside for mm -hmm. us. Um, it was, you know, obviously not really sanctioned the way that things are now. And, Correct. Um, yeah, when everything changed over here in BC, uh, because we don't have, like, it's weird. Canada has these different commissions that cover different bodies of sports, and it has ones that are broken up between uh, provinces. So here in BC, we don't have, like, a Muay Thai um, governing body the way we do in Alberta. So we can't have proper Muay Thai fights um, here in BC. Uh, okay. Okay. Whereas like when I was fighting, the rules were actually quite slack. So like in MMA, you could have an infinite amount of knees to someone's head from a clinch. Um, whereas now you, you can get away with one knee and then you have to break. There was, it, it was, a, it was quite a bit different game. Um, mm -hmm. And so when they changed all the rules and I was finally healed up, it just, it wasn't something that I was really excited you about. You know? like, okay. Okay. Yeah, I wanted more freedom to, you know, it's like what uh, like Bruce Lee was talking about freedom of expression, you know, sure. yeah. and yeah. and how martial arts should be that freedom um, to express. It'd be like painting a painting and only having your 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 uh, you know purple, yellow, and green. Yeah, you only got three colors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, want, I don't want to get stuck with primaries unless I'm allowed to mix them up. <laughs> um, yeah. So now, have you always lived in that area of uh, Vancouver around that area? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I've always been on Vancouver, either Vancouver Island or a little bit on the mainland. Okay. Um, I've, I've spent, you know, time overseas in different countries uh, and down south also, but always come back to this island. It's, they always, okay. I don't really want to talk too much about this island, but it is the most beautiful place on the planet. Uh, the pictures I've seen, um, I they it looks it it looks it yeah i mean it's so good. i mean yeah i haven't seen a lot but what i have seen it 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 really does look it um yeah so definitely um <clears throat> so when you were okay so you're training and all that um before we get into fma you, you now when you went to the other countries to train and all that was it was it solely was it within kickboxing muay thai or, or all that uh yeah yeah well, was, i mean i i went to uh thailand um to learn from kruo um who is a, an amazing legend of a man like all around really really gem human being mm -hmm. um he's uh uh i think now i could be i'm pretty sure he is within the bloodline of the people that were the instructors that were instructing the guard for the king Okay. Um, 
from old dynasties. And uh, I had read about him a little bit, and then I'd seen some of his videos online, and I was totally sold. So um, he instructs uh, Krabby Carbone and and Moy Baron. Oh, okay. And those just spoke to me. Like as soon as I saw Moy Baron, I was like, right. I was like headbutts, right? Because we get these clinch patterns, and I'm always thinking, I'm like. There's nothing from stopping me from jamming my head right into the face and falling mm. with an elbow or an elbow than a headbutt. And seeing how they were, um, you know, applying all these different really close quarter techniques, I, yeah, I was really excited because at that point, hold on, let me back up. So I lived in the city in Victoria. I was doing the MMA. I was doing the kickboxing, a little bit of grappling. I moved up island to get away from the city to go spend more time in the woods. Um, I started working at a boxing club up in uh, Courtney, uh, which is it's about three hours north of here. And one day the boxing coach introduced me to who my instructor is now as uh, a judo coach. Um, and the, it, <laughs> it was pretty funny because he was not a judo coach. I could tell right away, you know, you, you do enough martial arts, you can kind of see like that guy's a yeah, karate yeah. guy, that guy's a BJJ guy. And Frank was not a judo coach, but that's how he was introduced. And he came over immediately and we started talking and he laughed and he said, I don't know why he keeps telling people I'm a judo coach. (laughs) He's like, I'm not even teaching judo. (laughs) He's a, he was like a, he's kind of like the epitome of ninjutsu. Um, You know, winning by any means necessary or or I should say accomplishing the goal by any means necessary. And he was, yeah, he and I, uh, we we hit it off right away because I was up there wanting to learn bush skills, and that is a huge portion of of real ninjutsu is bush skills. So he was already practicing bush skills for the majority of his life in some way or another, and yeah, we ended up training immediately um, on that stuff and stick fighting and other things. So when I heard about Kruo and Moy Baron, Frank was like, "You should go, you know, like you should go, you should go to Thailand and learn from him." And um, before that, I hadn't really thought about doing too much travel training, Mm. Um, but it made sense. And then I saw this meme of um, of a guy walking on a road with a with a stick and a bag on the end of it, like a hobo. And on the side of it, it said, quit your job, uh, sell your stuff, travel the world, learn martial arts, die happy. And that was it. I was That's, like, okay, yeah. I am going to start doing exactly that. And I did. Yeah. I sold almost everything I owned and I gave away what I couldn't sell. And I, yeah, I went to Thailand for a month and then I went to Cambodia for two weeks and then back to Thailand for another month and then back to Canada for, wow. I think, like eight or nine months, then back to Thailand again. And yeah, back to Canada for a bit. And then next I started my FMA journey. But wow. it was, you know, it was definitely, I would say it was Frank's influence that got me looking more into. Yeah, more yeah. I mean, I mean, that's incredible that you're able to do that. I mean, that's just, uh, wow, wow, wow. I can't even imagine there. We got some people. We got uh, two on Arlene. Hey, haven't seen her in a while. But hey, Arlene. Yeah, give me. We got Brett Reese. Man, Dean, sir, I've tried joining in on many but for some reason i can't get the podcast maybe i need a new phone but i will miss my military grade phone that have been hi yet yeah, um brett we're always it's uh, always made public so you should be able to just by going my wall you should be able to see all of them but in event they're they're always put on youtube and of course i always list them in fma discussion if that helps um so um but that hopefully that'll help um Yes, folks, if you're watching, tell us where you're watching from and all that. So, all right, so you make the trips and all that, and you're convenient. What, um, what, got, what was your first exposure to, like, FMA? Like, um, <clears throat> you know, where did you um, – how did it come about? Who went in where? Um, well, you know, it was actually – it was probably – Frank was showing me a drill that his instructor had picked up from FMA, and he was calling it the – Basically, the I think it was the five, the five devils. He was calling it five devils, and you know we would know it as more of like an infinity, 
shape with okay. a stab in the middle. And it could change the pattern. It could be like a one, two, one, two, five, or a three, four. four. Three, okay. Three. Okay. And so he was doing it. He had taught me that with um, with a katana. So oh, we're doing it with a katana. Katana. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Frank. Frank is an amazing instructor. I, he is. I. I mean, I would love to be able to expose him more to the world, but you don't see him on any, any of my videos or anything because he just doesn't want to be. He doesn't like to film. Yeah. No, like he came down from the mountains a couple of weeks ago and taught push hands for a group of us. Um, so I got to film that and I'm, I'm going to edit that and maybe post a bit of it. But most of the training, yeah, he just doesn't want to, he doesn't want to be in, uh, attached to any of it. Um, yeah, he in the open. Just, no, wow, wow. So he showed you that and then where did it go that, from there? I mean, where that did was kind of, I didn't, yes, yeah. You know, I had, I had done, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dean. Um, I'm kind of jumping okay. around a bit. <laughs> um, I did have, I did do a couple classes a number of years before that in Victoria with a guy, but I never really thought of it as FMA as much as it was this guy's art. Um, because, you know, like we were talking yesterday, or you guys were talking yesterday, I was listening, um, what Mike was saying about how, you know, some of these instructors wouldn't have a, a they didn't have a name. They weren't like, oh, yeah. it wasn't codified. They weren't like, you learn this thing, this thing, and this thing. It was more like, this is my art. Here is the one I'm sharing. Um, and his name was, uh, Razik and he lived here in town and he was a student of, um, uh, Remy Latosa. Renee Latosa. Yeah, yeah. Latosa. We had Renee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really amazing instructor. Um, so Razik was one of his one of his students, and he was kind of a nomadic um, fellow. So I'd only trained with him a couple times, and it was more or less, I wasn't really training. I was just kind of there with my mind blown that people like him existed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, I'd been around fighting my whole life and whatnot, but his experiences that he shared with us and what he was sharing with us was done a lot differently. I mean, we, you know, he, he, he taught the entire class with a double uh, machete. And I remember asking a lot of questions and at one point him turning around and throwing a big angle number one at my face and just enough that it touched me. And I was like all, that was the whole thing I took from the rest of that class. Like, I can't remember anything else from it. Yeah, it was like that one moment. My, uh, head. <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't really like, I mean, I could say it was my exposure to FMA, but it, in a way it wasn't because I didn't, I just met somebody who was training and sharing some great variation of mm -hmm. it. Whereas that when Frank was showing me this, this five devils movement that he had learned from his instructor, that was kind of the beginning of the mechanics of FMA for me. I think when I first started to yeah, experience yeah. that philosophy of movement that we see in FMA, the, the broken flows and the fluid yeah. flows. Um, so, and then, yeah, go ahead. Oh. So, what was the uh, next stop as far as um, I guess the FMA uh, journey? There was a um, there was a fella uh, named Rob Robinson um, who was. He's a, uh, I think he's, um, I think he does, he's a theater, a theater director now. I'm not sure where he is, but really cool guy. Um, and he was a friend of a friend who was offering to teach uh, a, a six week um, clinic, basically on um, a mixture of FMA styles used for stick fighting. And okay. so I went to that and then I had students, um, that were with me in Cumberland and I brought all of them to that also um, because I figured, you know, it makes more sense if we all learn the same drills together. Sure, you work it together, sure. Yeah, we get so much better. And um, Rob was pretty cool. I liked his, something I really liked about him is when he did the movements that I'd seen before on like YouTube because after Frank showed me this, this Five Devils, I was like, oh, I started getting on YouTube and looking at yeah, yeah, yeah. And what Rob was showing was intention. He was showing um, in his mechanics, there was that like power to smash behind it. It wasn't just, just remembering yeah. the motions. Um, and for that reason, I was, I got kind of 
hooked on it right away. I was like, oh, okay, I like that. Uh, we convinced them to actually do another six week uh, instruction with us after the first one. But after that, he went to Europe to go do some sort of directing of, of oh, theater. Okay, okay, okay. And so he was gone. And uh, yeah, with my students, we worked on those drills as much as we could. And uh, we had a Saturday sparring club that got together and weapon sparred with everything from fencing to spear um, to plastic baseball bats to plastic machetes, like everything we could think of, you know, we'd get yeah. involved and wrestle and do some, uh, yeah, do some axe throwing, bit of everything. And so we started implementing all these drills that we could and everybody from our sparring group started working on these FMA drills together. Mm. They were not like your typical, um, like Sam Bayan or something like that. They were yeah. more like kind of asymmetric stick fighting attack and defense, okay. Um, okay. which was cool. I, I really enjoyed them. Um, and then the next real exposure would have been I went to Vancouver and trained with Ed Wong. Um, I'm sorry, what was the name again? Ed Wong. Ed Wong. You know, somebody just sent me a message. Matter of fact, it was just last night to interview him. Like, here's a guy was that the, you might want to. It just last yeah. night. Yeah. I yeah. I think I think it's a good idea for sure. He's he's a really rad cat. Um, I think yeah. I think you dig it. Wow, he's, okay. And he's got a crazy yeah. amount of experience, too. He's got uh, a lot of connections, a lot of people he's trained with over the years. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be really enjoyable. Yeah, it just came in last night. Just just to back up just a bit, the guy who you referenced, those two six-week periods, did he, did he happen to ever mention to you the styles he was pulling from? No, he just said he – I mean, he might have, but it, it didn't um, – not enough that it that it stuck you know um, yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm just curious that's all yeah. i think it was mostly yeah he would say filipino martial arts he gave reference to uh yeah he gave reference to dog brothers um to some of the material from there um yeah yeah, yeah, just, yeah, no, really. yeah, yeah no worries i was just curious if he happened to mention all that so now so we're on to uh, you so now you meet ed wong right? yeah yeah, and Ed's really cool. I like he's he's another guy who mixes up, um, you know, different bits, different bits, different styles together. Uh, there was some elements of uh, JKD um, mm -hmm. with some CLAT and some Western boxing, along with some Filipino martial arts. And he uh, he runs a class, I think, twice a two or three times a week in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. We've got a pretty cool group there. Everybody's super friendly, well trained um but again you know really inviting which is always nice and yeah yeah i think it'd be great to have him on yeah um, yeah i mean and i think i i definitely heard the name before i but i definitely did not make the association that he was in canada um oh yeah and, you know well there's there's actually two there's two ed wongs in vancouver that i know of um there's a tai chi master uh ed wong in vancouver Oh, and then you yeah, have the okay, and and um, yeah. Uh, what, what style was Ed Wong giving you? I know you see he incorporated different stuff in there, but did he ever mention like the the style per se? Yeah, it's um, they call it, I think it's urban, urban survival. Frick, I can't remember. I'm sorry. Um, no, there's okay. there's certain things that uh, I've got a I've got a particular set of learning disabilities that I was born with and there's certain sequences of information that I struggle to, yeah, no worries, to no worries. put together yeah. but it's weird because like with a stick I am very fluid I can yeah. whack whack all day long but then when it comes to actually dancing to music my body gets all jerky and doesn't know what to do <laughs> <laughs> no that's fine no 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 that's I mean hey no problem um but uh, so all right, so right, we're up, so basically around three people. You've got little different exposures from pieces and all that. Like you know, what was your um, like what resonated with you? Like uh, you know, what were your initial thoughts on the experience within just the lens of FMA? You know, what I mean, like what would you, what, you know, what were you thinking? You know, what were your thoughts? Um, I you know, I really liked it. The for me, um, I run everything through kind of a ninjutsu lens. 
So even though, you know, throughout my week, I train in a lot of different martial arts, they're all going through the lens of adaptivity mm -hmm. and um, accomplishing whatever the goal is. So with FMA, immediately, I liked the idea of training with a machete because it's something that I can find in every country, in every market. For Latin like America? No. Right? Mm -hmm. Anywhere. I can I, I could buy a machete off a guy on the side of the street in the Philippines for yeah. pennies almost, you know, like mm -hmm. compared to what I would use, like um, like if I, if I was only training with like a wakazashi or a katana. I mean, those are such specific weapons. And yeah. It's important, you know, that you don't get attached, obviously, you know, to the weapon that you're training and think of it more as a principle because mm -hmm. of you might not have it. And so FMA for me was, okay, we're all going to do these drills. We're going to do these games and it's going to be with something that is about, you know, about the length of your arm. And for me, immediately, I was like, okay, I really like that. I like that there is um, an emphasis on... Um, something that I can reproduce very easily if I ever need to. So right. it's not like um, a skill set that it has a diminishing return. And mm. of course, I like the fluidity of it too. I liked, I like the beat. I like the patterns. Um, mm. What I had been doing in the Krabby Carbong is also very fluid. It's, uh, you know, as you know, it's, it's got a lot of fluid techniques. We focused com almost completely on double stick crab and curb so was, Yeah, yeah, the double. Like I had off the arms at Stanford on. It. it seems fascinating. Oh, nice. Yeah, just but yeah. like when he was walking on it, just it just seemed the off lead structure and all that. It just it seemed you know, it seemed fascinating. Yeah, um, it's just not. A problem. It is. It's really cool, and you're and you're you create, you create, you create opens for the. For different body attacks too right yeah. so you're creating openings for kicks you're creating openings for trips yeah. um that yeah and that was one of the things that i really that kind of stung to me but i couldn't find a lot of instructors for krabby carbone whereas FMA, there, i don't think there's just a lot around no it's not the same <laughs> it's like i, mean, like, it's, I don't, think I don't it's know just, why yeah. it's beautiful like arland like because i asked arland off off the interview i said i mean like who's around like uh, in the north i was asking as far as the northeast and i think he mentioned somebody up north but there's just it's there's not a lot around you know i mean i would have like you know through these interviews i would have i think i would have found out if more were around i just don't think there's a lot you know it's not too bad the same. yeah there's not a lot yeah um well, but, uh, there's some, I know that Loki, I know that Loki, I think is, I think Loki does um, workshops from time to time in uh, Crab Carbone. Um, oh, did he get from Arlen? But I'm not from Arlen. It could, yeah, it could have been, could have been. I'm, I'm not sure. No. I, I don't think that yeah, he yeah. went to Thailand. He might have. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I think. I think that's what it is, is that, you know, that kind of flow that we see in that art um, yeah. that really, I don't know, it's intriguing. And it's, you know, it's something that you can do, um, like when you're doing your Karenza, when you're doing your shadow boxing, having that fluidity to it allows you to get into that flow state, which allows you to kind of unlock different range of motion, different ideas of motion. Um, yeah. And I think that that's, again, one of those things I think that really drew me to FMA and still does, you know, to this day. No, I think so. Yeah, no, but it it's, was, it's um, definitely fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and there's, you know, with Ed, when he was, when I took the lessons with Ed, it was mostly a focus on empty hand stuff. So it was a bit more of like oh, a okay. two can. Um, can but it was, yeah, it kind of it got it got me really thinking more and more about, um, you know, adding in the striking arts that I had already done into mm. maybe what do I do if I have a knife. You know, like how do I strike, control, grapple, yeah. um, use the knife, um, and that's what got me into uh, Sammy, the guys from Sammy from Austria. Um, and oh, um, yeah, I know you're talking. Um, it's, it's a, I know you're talking about. Yeah, um, it's a lot of the hobbit, lobit variation, definitely Pontuk, and like I see a lot of Anasano repack it, I mean, like kind of redeveloped. 
Yeah. Um, and all that, but I know exactly who, who you're talking about. Did you, so did you actually like what you studied with them as well? I, um, I wanted to fly out there, but it was just, I, yeah. between the cost of being there. So I wanted to go for a month. I didn't want to just go for a week. Yeah. Like you go there for a weekend or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to stay there and actually, yeah. you know, get some proper instruction and it was really expensive to stay in Australia or in Austria. So I found that they had an online, um, and like an online course, basically. Sure. And so I did that for about a year, year and a half, and it was amazing. I mean, the the Hubud Lubud I had originally seen on YouTube from Luke Holloway, and Luke, yeah, I was. Yeah. I was totally hooked. <laughs> like he, he sells it so well. <laughs> Makes it look so tactical. Like I yeah, was like, whoa, and then you're just flashing and hammering and he's swearing and all this. And I'm yeah, just like, animation. Fuck yeah, this is what I want. Animation yeah. And so, you know, I drilled a lot of his stuff online uh, with friends, but it wasn't until the Sammy guys that I was actually getting the instruction on mm. um, understanding what I was doing so that I could actually reshare it and so I could get in a little bit deeper. Uh, yeah. But that was really cool. And that actually influenced my Tai Chi instructor quite a bit because he really liked um, the application of the Hubud because it was so similar to the forehands drills that we often do in push uh, okay, okay. But it just it gave different lines of attack, different yeah. lines of defense. So it kind of added to the game that much more to play. Wow, wow. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I don't see... I remember seeing their their content on Facebook. I don't I don't um, unless I'm just not looking in the right place. But I don't see their stuff uh, anymore uh, on, on on Facebook. I'm I, I'm guessing they're still putting it out there, right, Sammy? Oh yeah, yeah yeah. I get uh, they're doing they're doing a lot of like online seminars, and I think I they, saying, they still yeah. have the uh, online program going too. Yeah yeah yeah, because they came to the East Coast. I want to say it was a few years back. Definitely pre-COVID. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. We're going to be saying, like, oh, this is pre-COVID. <laughs> but this is, like, I, I want to guess maybe 2017, 18. I think they went to Pennsylvania, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, okay, okay. So I'm right. Okay, good. Okay. And, yeah, um, yeah. But, so, but, yeah, I, I know people have done it, and they, they spoke highly – you know, on the stuff, but uh, it's definitely got an Anosano blend flavor, you know, definitely, um, and all that. But uh, so, so from Ed, like, who, um, who was the next, uh, who was the next stop for as far as your effort majoring? Um, I was, yeah, there was a couple of years there, I think, where I was just, or a year anyway, yeah, it was probably about a year where I was just, you know, working on the material that I'd gotten and. Mm -hmm. Lots of YouTube, lots of Sammy instruction. And then uh, a friend of mine named Max um, from Cumberland, I can't remember what he said. He messaged me about some buddy of his that was interested in getting a hold of me. And I was like, yeah, okay, I don't know who that is, but sure. I'd already been putting out, you know, a little bit of media online, like stuff on Instagram and Facebook. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Just trying to promote like kind of different ideas of living, you know, closer to the woods and whatnot and uh paulo rubio contacted me and he was like what he said he says i'm like who the fuck are you dude <laughs> i was like one of the first messages he was just like where'd you come from and i was like what i was like who are you and he's like he's like i've seen some of your videos he's like how come i've never heard of you and i was like i don't know who you are either <laughs> and like we ended up having a good follow lab. <laughs> Oh, it was, yeah, total Paulo. He's awesome. He, um, yeah, we ended up talking and he was saying, uh, he was saying he had all these different contacts for martial arts stuff. And I was like, well, who do you know um, that's in the Philippines that, you know, I would probably, like a guy like myself would like to learn from, um, you know, because I like to spar. I like to play. I like to play on both really yin and yang. Like I'll, I love mm -hmm. to go really soft with push hands. I like to go really hard with push hands. You know, I like to have soft rounds of technical sparring. I like to have crushing rounds of sparring. Yeah. Um, and he was like, oh, I got these these guys I know in Manila um, from the PTK Hankilan. 
And I had no idea mm. what any of that was. And um, so he mentioned uh, Mandela Patch. And so I contacted Mandela Patch that day and I said, hey, would you be interested, like, to having a foreigner there for a month? Um, I'll train every day. And I promise to do all the lessons and I'll pay for privates on top of classes. And, and he said, yeah, for sure, come whenever you want. So I opened a window on my phone. I bought a plane ticket. <laughs> I messaged him back like a couple hours later. And I was like, okay, hey, I got my plane ticket. I'm going to be here at these dates. Is that okay? And he was just like, what? <laughs> like, holy oh, shit. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, he said, yeah, come on out. Come on out. And um, yeah, I got on a flight about a month later, two months later. I was on a flight heading out to Manila to learn from Patch. And, what year? What year was um, it? On the way there. Sorry? What year was this about? What year? Uh, I think that was, uh, that might have been 2017, 2018. Oh, okay. So not that, okay. So not that long ago. Okay. Okay. No, not too long ago. Yeah, it was recent. And I stopped, um, I stopped in Toronto on the way out and met Paulo in person and also met uh, um, Archie Luz. 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 Archie, yeah. Yeah, He's coming out. and and had a chance to get a lesson in yeah. Calisil Stream from Archie, Archie um, which yeah. was really really cool. Like Archie, yeah. I yeah, as soon as I met him, I I felt like I'd known him for years. You know, we yeah. um, were both we both had followed a lot of the similar kind of instruction as far as movement. He was um, really into Muay Thai, kickboxing, and Muay Thai, and also kettlebell and body weight movement. Yeah. And um, his emphasis on sharing uh, K KI with um, with an emphasis on, on blade and on cutting and mm. um, body positioning. I really liked his footwork uh, and his angling. Um, yeah, it was it was really cool, man. I was really really happy about it. And Paulo was actually recorded. Uh, he recorded and released part of the lesson um, on the aperture, which was pretty rad. Oh wow! I'm gonna have to just, I'm gonna have to look that up because here's the thing about this is what I understand from Archie from other KI people. He understands, uh, and the and the key thing that's come across the board from um, you know people I talked to within KI is that he truly understands body movement and motion. Like one of the things that constantly like yeah. really understand. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm looking forward to getting on. I'm I'm thinking um, oh, yeah. October. Well, um, yeah, that'll so, be awesome. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely. Um, so you go to the Philippines, um, and uh, so let's let's hear it. So, oh man, <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> it was super fun, but I was. It was a wild. It was a wild ride. I had looked up. Um, so generally, when I travel, I will spend most of my money will get spent on uh, training and food. I will spend the least amount of money on yeah. accommodations. I will find. The yeah, absolute yeah. Be there. place yeah. that's closest to whatever dojo I'm training at. And, sure, you know, sure. it's ended me up in caves in Thailand and I've ended up in some wild places. But the one in the Philippines I stayed in was really interesting. It was a hostel uh, right in Quezon City um, on um, just off of uh, Kamuning Road. And it was it was definitely a different part of town than you'll see anywhere in Canada, <laughs> to say the least. I hear Kazon um, rough. Hear, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was cool though, because what I find with a lot of these kinds of neighborhoods is, um, you know, someone like myself, a white guy covered in tattoos, we're a bit of a, a we're a bit of a novelty. And in so, you know, in, so in that being the case, you know, us being a novelty, it, it kind of throws people off. Like, okay, the criminals in a lot of these neighborhoods aren't they're not trained to deal with guys like myself. They're more like the you're criminals in Manila in Makati. Yeah, you're, What's yeah. that? You're an enigma. They're like... Yeah, like, yeah, totally. I'm like, not, they want to be my friend. Whenever, you know, whenever I've ended up in these neighborhoods in Mexico mm -hmm. or anywhere else in the world, Croatia, they, they're like, who's that guy? And what yeah, the I'm fuck is sure. he doing here? Yeah, so the moment you, you know? put a question mark on yourself, they're going to be like, oh, yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe wait for the next... <laughs> he leave that guy alone. <laughs> he looks he looks way too confident to be here. Yeah, now if you were walking down the street in Kazan and 
you were Caucasian and you had a suit and tie and you're carrying this briefcase, we might be having a different story. I mean, yeah, just saying. You know I mean? Yeah, very different. <laughs> yeah, no, I got high fives from guys that would make most people hide in their car. Um, yeah. Who ended up being really friendly, who ended up, you know, I'd see almost every day on my way to class. And uh, yeah, I had a great time. I met I met some really cool friends in the neighborhood. There was a, a lady that did the laundry for the hostel I was staying in. I made friends with her and her husband, and she taught me a number of different plants and a number of different fruits that were wild and medicinal growing in the area, um, which was, yeah, really cool because, I mean, here in Canada, I'm, almost every day I'm trying to learn either plants, mushrooms, or trees. I'm constantly, you know, adding to my basket, mm -hmm. and... Anytime I can go overseas, it's the same thing. Like when I was in Thailand, I got a massive book on uh, medicinal plants um, there. And most of it's written in Thai, but the Latin names are Latin names. And I can just use those to look up the rest of the information oh, in English no, okay. once okay. I have the proper identification of the plant, tree, sure. and mushroom. Okay. And so it's the same thing there. It was really cool to connect like the local people that way. Um but it was it was awesome, man. You know, the, the everybody's instruction there, like Patch Mandela, um, he was really patient with me. Um, there's, he took some pictures of me struggling and posted them online, which I'll share with you later. They're really funny. <laughs> Seeing like right, the right. face you make when you can't figure out some I basic can't. shit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was cool because he was he's um, he's the kind of instructor that I like that is confident in the material they share to the point where they will invite you to learn from other people. Okay. You know, they're not scared. They're not unwilling to allow you to. Yeah, um, you're there overseas. So they yeah. want to expose you to, which that's, I mean, that's, I, don't, I mean, that's, that's normal. You know what I mean? Instead of like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this guy like right here. And, you know, and, yeah. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Patch, Patch set me up with his other instructors, you know, like mm -hmm. Guru, Guru Dan was amazing. Um, Dan is one of the senior instructors from, the Hank Keelan crew in Manila, and he's amazing. Phenomenal so is, people. Yeah, be honest. I'm not familiar with, with this grouping, uh, to be honest with you. And uh, so when you, wow, oh, and, uh, we got Elric here. Oh, they're so, so cool. cool. So really, they're so, so cool. Are they under Guy Hay directly? Uh, okay, I would say, you know. I, would, I know that, yeah, I know that Patch trained with GT, but I think more more jared more philip oh so under jared oh i didn't realize jared had got oh okay, okay. yeah okay. yeah and they've got a, they've got a decent group maybe because there's there's the north central and south groups I th i'd say maybe all together maybe 40 or 50 all together wow i see i this is new to me like i knew there was a pta presence obviously you know in negro so that but I, yeah. I, I wasn't aware that there was there was like a group there in uh, Manila. Huh. Oh, they're so yeah, they're they're amazing. I really I really dug them. They they would do you know two to three hour training sessions every class, and then we would usually spend about an hour and a half to two hours eating after. And yeah, yeah, it's always yeah. yeah. I guess that goes hand in hand, from what I understand. Oh, it's so good. It's, you know, that's another reason why I like FMA. Yeah. You know, like is the emphasis on food the emphasis on shared food, food is and drink. that is huge <laughs> and it's it's everybody i've met who does fma loves it you know yeah. it's uh that part of it really really speaks to yeah me it is it is um yeah that's okay i'm gonna have to look more into this group over there i just and um so when you all right so you're, you're staying there for a month obviously getting high dosage of uh ptk um what um when you came back did you continue i'm guessing you continue to seek that out or 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 what well um so while i was there towards the end of my visit patch connected me with the the pta university um okay. and that yeah so that's jared's jared's program and um so that you get a weekly online kind of drip instruction from that and uh, they've got a, a Gabe uh, program set up so I can send videos to uh, Patch. He, walk, he reviews them, maybe sends a video or two back and oh, we okay. discuss, you know, the techniques. Um, so, like, you know, some back and forth, which isn't as 
as great as in-person instruction, it's but better is nothing. Well, better than, yeah, than just a book. It's better than nothing, yeah. Yeah, yeah totally, right? <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. I did that, and I kept doing that for, for a year um and you know shared everything i learned with my um other students um also frank even i, I taught frank the the cool the mama drill the sambayan um so, which was awesome because then i i get a chance to because he's really ninja you know like everything he does has got this like strategy built into it ninja. and so even even doing sambayan there's the, there's like I start to feel his strategy and see his game. And it is, yeah, it's really cool. It just allows me to kind of one up my game, getting beat that, that way over and over. No, that's, that's um, no. Yeah, no. And so I ended up going back a year later and going back to train with patch and, uh, and thank you. Oh, okay. okay. All right. So, so yeah, when you... I really, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I'd go back, I would have gone. I mean, I've got money put away right now. I'd go back. You know, to go back. To go back. Yeah, I know. I yeah, I, I gotta make that good. trip over there. I know. Uh, um, because I'm under Bong Abenir and some of uh, and Brandon Ricketts. I got I gotta get over there. It's just. Uh, I mean, now is not the time, but I mean, you know, I definitely have to yeah. do it. To get to see Elric. Um, but uh, when you, uh, with Jer with um with Jared's organization there. So are you? So are you part of Jared's organization? Yeah, yeah, I'm part of the PTTA. I've I've got a um I've been working on their online program and then getting graded in person. So I graded in what was that? Lacan Isa, I think. Lacan Isa in Jared's system. Um, and so you've been with him like five years or somewhere around there? No, no, no. This just last no, no, I got into I just got into the the PTTA yeah, maybe three years. Oh, three. Okay, so maybe three years. Okay, yes, and uh, so is this something anybody could just join online and they can start getting the content and then submit? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's it's a great program. Um, he's taken because yeah. you know that was the thing when I first got into the when I got into FMA, um, I was struggling a bit because the lack of codification. You know, I'd gone from um, like uh, with Frank. There's such a it's because it's mostly a Japanese art um, with other stuff adapted into it. There's a, uh, you know, there's a name for everything. There's yeah, a name yeah. for every technique. It's kind of universally known. And um, that I struggled with at first was the codification, lack of codification within FMA. But mm -hmm. with Jared's PTTA, he's kind of streamlined. Um, it's, there's a little bit less art there's still art within the PTTA, but there's a little bit less than you'd find in, in PTK. And so it's more streamlined towards, um, I'd say maybe even law enforcement, uh, kind of like how TRICOM is, but TRICOM yeah, even yeah. more streamlined. Yeah, because when I had Jared on, the feeling I got from him is that his umbrella information was not uh, some of the other PTA organizations, I actually like in talking to them, it actually seemed like this. And that's kind of what I'm asking because um, it made me think, uh, consider redoing PTK, but I would, but through the lens of Jared, because I kind of like the way he it was explaining what he does. I didn't see this huge umbrella information, which that like, like gives me anxiety attacks when the system is just so big. <laughs> I have to read, and then I have to like, we threw okay. I I won't be using this. Okay, I get that, you know what I mean. Like I like at my age, I just I don't have time for that anymore. I just don't have time. <laughs> well, you know, and that's I, I always tell people it's all it's all up to your goals. It's like you know, um, it's yeah. really important. Like any of my students, as soon as we start training together, the first conversation is like, well, what are your goals? Like, you know, people often will say, oh, I'll learn self defense. And I'm like, okay, but what kind of self defense? Like, what kind of yeah yeah like what where's where does your uh, willingness to do things and you know like because mm. your self defense can be taught every single day while you're walking down the street simply by you know building awareness. your awareness yeah, yeah absolutely and yeah. you don't need me to punch at you or hit you with a stick to do yeah, that you're haymakers all day yeah i know <laughs> that's right it's it all depends on what your goals are and i think you know yeah. the cool thing about um what jared's offering is he's taken He's taken a lot of really sound principles <clears throat> that are found in all martial arts that are applicable 
And yeah. because of the emphasis on sparring within the PTTA, because you have yeah. to spar in order to grade, um, it's there's a lot of stuff that gets some level of pressure testing okay. under these kind of you know a little bit artificial moments, but more so than a lot of traditional arts allow these days. Um, no, no, I definitely, I definitely got that for him. Like there was, they definitely spar. Yeah. There's depth. Yeah, I definitely, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. You know, and there is still room for the art. There's um, there's still an appreciation for it throughout the PTTA. It's never in any way discouraged or dispelled. Mm. It's, you know, there's a lot of ways to make things work, too, that um, people at first will see. Because I know for myself, I'm, I'm quite young in this art. Like, I am quite young within martial arts, period, compared to a lot of my uh, instructors that I learned from. Mm. And I think that... Um, something that I find that keeps me humble is remembering how often I've been wrong about things, you mm -hmm. know, like um, sometimes I'll remind myself because you'll see a technique or you see a drill and you're like, oh, that's useless. Like, why would I even do that? That's like, yeah. I'm doing this thing that puts me in this bad position a million times. Why would I do that to build bad mm -hmm. habits? But then I try it. I give it some trust. You know, I give it some time. And I more often than not draw attributes from whatever that thing was I thought was useless. Um, and I just I remind myself of that <laughs> whenever I'm learning some no, new martial art. I'm like, hey, I think remember the times you were wrong, bro. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I think there's an element of martial maturity that comes. Like, in the, like there was a time frame I was kind of like that. And like, now I, I know what I want and I know what I don't want. I absolutely do. Like I have one hundred percent confidence, and like my ability to discern, yes, that would benefit my journey. Yeah, and, uh, it's nothing wrong with it. It just it's not gonna benefit my journey. Like, yeah, and I think that just comes along, like just with martial maturity, the getting to know what you want and what fits yeah. you and what doesn't. I just I think we all kind of go through that where we, where in the beginning we might dismiss something, but through maturity we might, uh, you know what there's two elements in there i think it benefit me it's worth doing the whole you, you know what i mean i just think it just comes with time I, you know i don't know oh that's that that makes sense you know that it's the in the bushcraft world we'd call it dirt time dirt you're time getting in time. you're getting it you're getting uh, in there. Get, get it dirty and do the things <laughs> you know? right you're right there looking at tracks it's your dirt time you know um i only really know that because i'm part native american so uh <laughs> So, but, uh, yeah, well that, that, you know, those are, that is honestly the, the tracking was the doorway for me into bushcraft skills in a lot of ways, yeah, you know, it is really something amazing. I wish I put more time. It's fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. And you become one on so many levels when you're out there alone and you're just in that element and you got to really focus and really get in touch. It's, yeah, it's it's um, I think something everybody should try and experience, even on like yeah, the most basic basic level. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know. But just yeah, oh, I totally agree. Nature observation yeah. is like one of the biggest brain builders that I know of. I know, but it's like you know, it everything else that we do. But more and more gets in your life, and you got this yeah. three dogs. You know the kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? So my nature's. Oh, New York, watching them ups. <laughs> well, you know, that's huge. You watch, you can watch how they're, you know, yeah. how they make tracks and no, they're, they're watch how they eat things. Oh, yeah. They're all strong. the detail. Yeah. yeah. One of the biggest, uh, biggest ones for me about watching domestic dogs, um, that one of the lessons I got from it was uh, wild dogs, they're walk, 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 walk. They're pretty, like, their trails are pretty consistent, like wolves. When I've tracked wolves or tracked oh, yeah. Coyotes, yeah. Yeah. coyotes. Whereas when I get to a, Domestic dog, it's walk, 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 pause, twist, and shift yeah. to see where the owner is That's and what the owner's doing. Interesting, yeah, yeah. You know, whereas like the wild dogs, they never do that, but domestic yeah. dogs are always like, "What's going on, human?" Yeah, it's taking so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They turn like, yeah. Whereas the other one, they just they know they have an area and agenda and a mission. <laughs> That's right. They have but, a mission. Um, so what? Um, I say, new man, I'm gonna enjoy this. Um, all right, so you go back, you're there. I mean, you're with Jared, so obviously you found PTK. 
that this is kind of the art you want to do and this and um and all that but you also mentioned and you're also associated with another ptk instructor in canada am i am i correct in that yeah yeah totally i um so um yeah i i try i try to learn as much as i can from whoever i can to just develop um so i should back up the, sure. my whole thing with with um with the los strategy the los strategy is the last one standing strategy doesn't mean i'm the last one standing by any means no. it's it's the it's a philosophy of research and study okay. and for me that is searching out the most um the best ways to learn different things and the best things to learn and then okay. different ways to apply them in as many ways as possible with as many implements as possible. Um, and so I've, I've definitely, when I first started FMA, um, I was a bit confused because I didn't realize there was a lot of uh, dramatic tension between different groups and different people. Um, that I would, I'd never seen that before. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> You're trying to say that I had politics and FMA, yeah. like, yeah, right? Like, I was, it kind of blew my mind a bit. I was like, why, why, like why you know? with the Sayox and the Atienzas when I was uh, there with PTK? Oh, man, yeah, that was that was real fun. <laughs> That's so crazy. See, I had, I had no idea because I never saw that. I was in, in it. I was all three. I was in it. Oh, my god. Oh. Yeah, that's that's wild, man. So I was kind of, I didn't, yeah, I didn't really know what to think because I was, I went to the Philippines, um, the first time I went there, and like so on the way that trip we were talking about the first time I went, I I went and learned from from uh, from Archie, mm -hmm. and then I and then I went and learned from Patch, and then I learned from a couple of his instructors, and then on the way back I stopped in in Montreal and I taught a ninja camp just north of Montreal, and then mm -hmm. after ninja camp. I went down and learned from Philip Jelena and then I came back over here and I didn't think anything of it because I'm just learning from these people yeah. that know way more than I do who are really cool. And that's all I could think of. And then I got back and I was online and talking to people and, and reading comments and I was like, Holy crap. Like people are getting like warped over these yeah. oh, loyalties. It's, it's, it's that, unbelievable. It's the germ. It is. It's, it's, it sucks because it creates division where there is none. Mm -hmm. Like there's, they're bound by a being human and two having a love for martial arts that happens to be from the Philippines. Right. What happens and, is the emotional and subjective attachments exceed or override the objectivity, which is you and your journey, and you're trying to get everything from everybody, but. And, oh, it, I believe me. I, I can go. I mean, that could be a show right there. <laughs> yeah, oh, totally. On, late nineties, two thousand. I mean, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's 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 it sucks. It, it does, but when it does, it does. Yeah. Well, you know, I I I hashtag uh, PTK United all the time, and it's because you know I I always think about you know human beings we are really weak um even our strongest human being compared to an animal that lives outside all year round we're, we're just brittle. yeah we're brittle you know what i mean we we break we cut we bleed so easy and you know but together we are so powerful you know as human yeah, beings we can together. plan we can communicate we can like there's just we can do things that a lot of other creatures can't do and you know, I always think of that, and I'm always like, "Damn it!" I'm like, "I wish more of these people would just get I know, together." I know, I know, I know, and I think I can honestly say, COVID. I think the good of COVID, I think it did bring some unity because people right. were forced to do, you know, they were forced to do online training. Then some people yeah. crossed over and checked out other people's online training. So I, I think there's been some improvement in that area, um, but it's still. Unfortunately, I mean, it, it's still there. You know, this is a very passive aggressive community. Not everybody, not everybody, not everybody, but there's an, there's an absolute aspect of passive aggressiveness in this community. It's just, you know, yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah that's true, man. I, you know, and I think that, you know, the more and more, um, 
you know, because I think you really hit it. Like, I think that the more and more people getting online and um, yeah. checking out other people's content and then connecting with people like, you know, maybe you know, instructor so-and-so doesn't want to teach anymore because of COVID, mm-hmm. but instructor so-and-so, other guy, wants to. And it's like, yeah. that could really help a lot of people to step out and meet other human beings because I, I find more or less most people get along. No, no, no. I think, you know, what it is, is I think it's the attachments. Like you're under so-and-so and you've been here and you're reluctant to go over there, even though you're the most important piece aspect of the journey, not the teacher or the system. It's really True. you, but some people lose sight of that because they're, you know, well, I'm under such and such. And, you know, and, and they, I think they lose sight of their own individuality. I, I think that, I think, I think a lot of individuals get lost under these big systems or names and they forget that you're the most important piece because without you and the 20 others, there wouldn't be, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's a yeah. weird dynamic sometimes. I don't know. But I think like you said, sure. the online, I think it made people cross over that normally wouldn't have if there wasn't this, the COVID situation, I think. Yeah. They weren't forced into it. Yeah. 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 Well, and you know, that, that was like, the, the, like I was saying earlier, I really like instructors that, <clears throat> that like to make more connections, you know, mm-hmm. um, the the workshop that Frank put on a couple of weeks ago on push hands, there was, there was practitioners from all kinds of martial arts mm-hmm. there. It wasn't just people doing push hands. I know, I know. Yeah. There was all kinds of guys there and they all had so much fun exchanged mm-hmm. information after and are going to continue on their martial arts journeys together in some aspect. And, oh, you know, mm-hmm. it's just better human beings, better culture, better community. It just works out better for all. I'm with you. I totally agree. But there's that tribalization. Like, well, no, then he might get my student. And because then when the monetary right. aspect comes in, right, it opens up. And I do have some empathy in that arena because if you have a business and this is your sole means of income, well, I I have an aspect of empathy empathy for that. However, yeah. when it goes crosses the line of controlling somebody's journey, because I've been there and it's happened to me. I, at the time, yeah. I didn't have enough martial maturity to kind of discern what was really going on. Now, when I look back now, I, I do. But that when there's some controlling aspects put on somebody's journey, I have a real issue with that because, man, you're controlling. You know what I mean? That's just not fair, you, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it totally isn't. That's that's somebody's own, you know, uh, problems coming in. and uh, It's their insecurities. It's their, it's their insecurities. That's what it is. Yeah, I've got this. I get the saying. Um, I get the saying. It's uh, don't be jealous, be awesome. Yeah. And you know, it's like if you're that worried that your students are going to leave, be way more awesome than the guy that you and think they're going to go. Where with. they wouldn't want to leave. Like I tell my students all the time. I say, look, man, you should always, always go seek out other people. I go, you're the most important piece of the journey, not me, not the system. Yeah. And I go, you're going to be much better and all that. So. And I think if, if you're an instructor, I think you present that and you instill that, I think they see you in a different light. Like they say, oh, wow, man, like he really advocates for me to go branch out. Like, man, that's that's kind of refreshing. Like, yeah, I think if if you present that, I I, I think that resonates with, with students, you know? I think. Oh, I, I know it does for me. I think it's huge yeah. for me. It, um, yeah, it makes such a difference. And I find like whenever my students go somewhere else for a while, they come back always and they bring back some other stuff that Which I is, might not have known. That's what you want. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like go out and forge some techniques and bring I it back know. for the class. Or... I know. Then you, back, you, want you want them to bring back so you don't have to go out there. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. Get those tentacles out. <laughs> oh, really? You're going, oh my God. Yeah, would you, would you mind not taking notes and then you can bring that's right. Yeah. Get a little video, please. Yeah. hundred percent, man. hundred percent. It's, you know, and that's, that's like that, that was something that actually another reason why I really liked um, FMA was uh, one of the first dinners I had after class with the group of the Hank Keeling guys. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them had cut, he had a couple, uh, a few, a few uh, red horses and, and he came over and the, the infamous red horse. The Red Horse is like the strongest beer ever in the That's Philippines. What <laughs> That's what he is. He, uh, yeah, so Glenn comes over and he puts his arm around me and he says, what is the first rule of fighting? 
And I was like, win. And he's like, what's the, he's like, what's the second rule? I was like, win by any means necessary. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and he laughed and he said, oh, he's one of us. Mm-hmm. And I was just, you know, there was that idea of like, um, that adaptability in their technique, the adaptability mm-hmm. in their system. Um, like there was times when patch during class would say, Darcy, can you instruct this part of the class? Um, you know, we're like, we're doing some empty hand striking. Um, he would ask if I could, I could put in my two cents on some empty hand and elbow striking and headbutts and stuff like that. Oh, awesome. Um, if, if we're doing takedowns, cause I've got really good throws with a stick, um, mm-hmm. or empty hand. And he would, he'd ask me, can you, you know, run us through some, um, you know, single legs with, with a stick or mm-hmm. a number of other types of techniques that I learned, um, through the Japanese arts with a stick. And, that was, yeah, that was, I felt, you know, um, that much more connected to not just yeah, him, but to everybody else. Awesome. And to bring stuff in. Yeah, he's making, the, I, I mean, I, I know, I wish more just would do that. I, I really do. I think, I don't know. But some just get, yeah, I don't know. Oh, we got, oh, we got Mark Stewart from Thailand. Thai Hillbilly. <laughs> and we got Emmanuel Hart from France. Oh, and Trisha Dawn. <laughs> Yeah, Mark Mark is super cool, man. I saw one of his videos on some knife stuff like years ago. And I was like, again, it was just me on YouTube looking, like trying to find some Mm. cool instruction. And I found some in Mark's and I was like, oh, I like this. And I liked how he instructed. I liked his his chillness and uh way back. I had him on. Yeah, he's yeah, he's interesting. Had Trish on. He is Mark on. Yeah. And I really liked his, his emphasis on footwork too. You know, he was kind of explaining like a, a JKD style of footwork with a knife work. But he's got um, Ted Wong back. His lineage was Ted Wong. Most are oh, under Dan's oh. lineage. His lineage is Ted Wong. So, I mean, he's really unique uh, in, my, in my opinion. You know, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool, man. I'd love to learn from him in person one day. Well, you're, you're going to have to go back to Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to trust me. I, you know, I've got my my instructors that I trained with uh, at Simbi Muay Thai. There, um, I still talk to pretty often, and yeah, we make jokes. You know. Yeah. Oh, there's there's like you said, there's so many unreal um, instructors out there. I know, there's I know. So many. There is, and there is, and the thing is, after you know, doing this show, like you know, I mean, just the people that. I've met from afar and like you really, yeah. And that, and that world just gets, you know what I mean? And Mark Stewart, like he's coming back on, I think maybe October on his cone town, but yeah, he's definitely interesting. Yeah. If you can go see him, man, that. Yeah. I definitely would love to. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a quite a, I've got like a list of guys around the planet that I'd really like to go learn from. Right. Um, <laughs> there's a guy in uh, Croatia named uh, Dean uh, Rorscher, Rorschach. I think huh, he's, yeah. he's a Shihan in the Bujin Khan. Um, but he's okay, okay. taken the Bujin Khan Budo Tai Jitsu and made it more applicable in our modern day. Um, he's taken, he's applied it to knife, applied it to gun. Um, oh, wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he would be really cool to have on something like this. He also, he had a, there was a video of him floating around with Doug Markaida in his backyard in Croatia doing some Cali at one point. Um, and just running through some drills to get yeah, some flow drills. His name, if you remember, think of it, if you could just send me it via messenger, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely look him up. Sure. Oh yeah, Here, I'll, I'll find I'll find some of his right now and send yeah, it to you. Yeah, yeah, I would, He's somebody I would, I would definitely definitely look up. Um, yeah, he's really cool, and um, he's easy to contact too. Like I messaged him just off Facebook one day, just randomly, and he was like, "Hey, how's it going?" Oh, he's a, oh, so he's receptive. Oh, that's good. Okay, okay. Yeah, definitely. I would definitely um, uh, yeah, for sure follow up on that. Yeah. Um. So oh. We're, uh, so what's your um, just while you're doing that, um, what you know now that you've been obviously BTK, you're exposed to all the different weapons. What you, what's your lens like? What's your lens on empty hand versus knife? Like um, no one. Oh, uh, I, it's something I work on. As I, I work on probably as much, if not more, than just knife. Yeah, I try that's to my training too, because I think that's what I'm going to see out there. You know. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's if you if you are having a knife duel with another person, you've made some really big mistakes already. I think <laughs> it's like it even happens. I mean, think about it. Like, I mean, like I know we train for attribute development and you know knowing what he could do offensively, understanding offensively. So I, I totally get that, and I think there's absolute value in that. But yeah, the empty hand. Um, I just man, like I, in other words, when I was with Sayok and all that, it was a lot of the tapping and all that. And I understand it if you want to clear to get to your own weapon. I think there's yep. absolute value in that. But just going from the premise of just applying and tapping on somebody that's doing some machine or coming flying in or over, man, it freaking, like, it broke down on me. Like, yeah. honestly speaking, like, if I didn't do two-on-one, man, it just, yeah. anyway, I was nullifying, like, not freaking getting hacked, you know? What's your, what's your find? yeah. I have not gotten to the level I have in my own training, not gotten to the level of knife tapping that I would be able to do it even in a sparring context without That's, getting. It um, wasn't, it wasn't coming out for, I, I was failing. Yeah. I gotta be honest. Like I, it's what, That's one of those things about Jared's, um, Jared's take on a lot of the stuff that I really like is that um, because of his time in law enforcement and his uh, time teaching law enforcement, he's i think he's had to keep he's had to keep a lot of stuff really safe now i i should say that I've, also, I've also trained with guys who can make knife tapping work um like under but there's skill level pressure everything i yeah, it's pretty hard pressure man like i i like that's one another reason why i love loki because loki we spar after every class like every class yeah. we have a lot of contact mm -hmm. um and yeah, I've definitely we've done some of the knife tapping stuff together, and I've gone pretty pretty fast with a lot of broken patterns, and he's been able to keep up in a way that I couldn't even come close to. I mean, so I, that, man. That's and I like, and I think that if he was, if he maybe knife tapped and then two on one, would be more than likely what he would probably do. No, no, that's see, I agree with that. Like, okay, you yeah. brought initial contact to two on one. I'm totally yeah. okay with that. My mindset though is like, okay, I'm I am not going to do two on one. I am going to just uh, just work on tapping, and I, it, to me, it's a lens. Okay, you're not stopping. You're defending. You're not stopping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. You got to add. You got to okay, add. So that's, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. No, I'm I'm with you on that. If he does that to get the two on one, I'm totally being yeah. that. Okay, okay. Yeah, no. I think that I think that there's I think that again, you know, I, I am I am pretty like low on the totem of understanding a lot of stuff when it comes to fma but i think that a lot of the time when you see those uh really fast knife tapping drills i think they're demos more than anything no, else it's totally yeah it's like yeah exactly you really know what's coming and, yeah 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 and i and i appreciate that you know for for a certain for a certain need and, and want but um yeah i think the stuff that um, you're seeing right now come out of the tricom with Jared on as far as um, surviving the edge, I think that that's awesome stuff. Like yeah, check it out. one of the guys I train with is a rugby player who is an absolute frigging smasher. He is like 45, 46 years old. I've been, I've been training him in boxing, kickboxing for about a year now mm. and teaching him all kinds of knife and stick and stuff. And he is freaking a beast so i am really grateful for him to be able to train certain things against and doing a lot of the um tricom stuff that i've learned from jared's online program um i i put it against this guy in pressure and he does not want me to win he does not want me to get no, no, he can resistance yeah, yeah 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 man and he's a big rugby player you know he's like he's got 50 pounds on me and so it's it gives me a chance to work on a lot of details um, that I find work. You know, they work under that kind of pressure. Um, granted, it's not a real knife that we're working with. Um, yeah, and I know that everybody, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, that you know. would – no, and that's, a, that's another can of worms, I'm sure. But I think that, like, I just have to keep in mind that if somebody was – because I've been, like I said, I've been stabbed. I've been slashed. Um, the moment when that knife comes out, if you see it, it changes your reaction to it if you see it yeah, um, see because it, like when i got stabbed in the hand um he was the guy was trying to stab me in the stomach 
and I had grabbed, I had two on one, then one hand was grabbing the knife and the hand and one hand was grabbing the wrist. I had absolutely no training and no idea what to do, but I've secured the weapon first and then I laid an offensive attack until I could get a hold of the weapon. Did you see, you um, just hit on something. You just hit on something so important. Do you, you see what I'm getting at? It's natural. You want to do oh, yeah. on one. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's not going to be natural. You're going to go to gross motor when this up here is getting overwhelmed. And that's what I mean. See? That's, yeah. That's, yeah. I, I find that it's, I, I find the situations that I've been in that were, um, you know, real life conflicts, uh, getting that, getting as much control over the weapon, the weapon bearing limb, keeping the weapon bearing limb away from the other hand um, yeah, as much as possible. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, in Ninja 2, we have a, a terminology called Wakara, and it's like a separation. And, you know, we use that as a principle to separate their mind from their body, but also to separate yeah. their ability to pass weapons and, and create yeah. more problems for them. And that's, you know, getting that two-on-one and driving it away from them as hard and as fast as possible. Um, I'm there. It seems to be what works when I, when I do it in sparring, and it seems to be what works when me. I do it with under a lot. You separate the arm from the body, and I'm yeah. telling you, uh, it's uh, I totally, uh, no argument here. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. That, that, that's refreshing. <laughs> now, so. you know, one thing I do like, though, one you know, we'll, we'll play the empty hand versus the knife. Yeah. But we'll also play games where it's empty hand versus knife till you have control. So empty hand versus knife. Now I'm going into control for either my firearm. I'm going control for my knife. Yeah. And just playing those games, you know, or also going empty hand to control to escape, um, not yeah. just empty hand to control to disarm. Uh, there's just there's I mean, it's like any game right? we can add variables no, think, and we can really yeah, enjoy you. it and work on it. As long as there's that context here, like you've got loved ones, you have to deal with it because you got you're not gonna leave them to the wolves. I mean, right? No. But you're alone. Yeah, you're gonna do anything yeah. possible to maybe arm drag to get the the hell out of there. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, yeah exactly. I think it's important, like you mentioned. Those yeah, things. no, I, I think that I think that because I when I first started learning with Frank, when I first started learning um, stick fighting, he also taught me the Kian Hapo, the um, series of wrist locks. Eight, eight, okay. basic, eight basic wrist locks. They're the same ones that are in FMA. Um, and I remember the way we were learning them was often standing. So like uh, Amote, Ogak, you know, standing, he's doing this wrist lock. Or Ura, I'm getting you know pressure against here. I'm being bent mm. down, arms being dragged up. Um, when I first started doing that with him, I remember asking him, like, why are we doing this standing? Why are we doing it this way? It doesn't make sense. And it's because we were just drilling the mechanics of it. But eventually, we actually were trying to put all those into the right context. You know, so like, how do I put this person either against the ground or on a wall against a tree in a bush so that they can't escape the movement? They can't just simply roll out of it or mm. twist out of it. Um, and it was that same kind of like emphasis on context that I think that a lot of people need to look at when it comes to um, knife control, you know, yeah. bladed control of any sort. Because... It, yeah, you often don't see it, you know, if you do get into a knife conflict, you usually don't see the first couple of attacks. Um, when I got stabbed uh, in the arm and in the back, I didn't see those. I didn't see it at all. Um, I don't even know to this day. I don't know who stabbed me. It was during a brawl. I, I just dealt with it after when one of my friends who was also there, he got a huge stake almost cut off of him. And he had to rush to the hospital. And that's when I started looking at myself to see where I'd been stabbed. And that's when I found that I'd been stabbed in the arm and the back. And it's, you don't usually see those things happen. You know, no, um, no, when I was face splashed open, I didn't see the first attack. I saw, you know, I saw the knife brandished after the fact. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was able to control the situation. Um, and I think that's, again, why gross motor skills are so important is because your average person you guys touched on last night about adrenaline uh when you get a dump if you're not trained in adrenaline if you don't know how to deal with it you won't even breathe you know let alone you know well, let alone do the intricate techniques no 100 100 percent. there has to be stress inoculation introduced i was how you if you don't, if you can't deal with it in a classroom setting how are you gonna deal with it out there i mean <laughs> yeah exactly it's like a big and, you know we have a build up yeah 
in class, we know what's happening. It's like, okay, we're going to class, you know, that initial yeah. little adrenaline. Whereas yeah. like when you get stabbed or attacked, it's often just like, boom, just happens. And then, yeah. So, I mean, I think that, I think there's ways that we can kind of create these artificialities in training. Um, sure. And I, I think a lot of different groups are doing that. I think it's freaking awesome. Hmm. Like I love to see a lot of the stuff that uh, Paulo and Mark and, and Joe and all those guys, all the stuff they're doing down at the, down at the boudoir, like yeah, but yeah, really yeah. awesome. You know, yeah. all the experimentation. Cause that's like, you know, that's kind of what we were doing up at our dojo in Cumberland for a long time with my instructor there. We had all these different guys on our Saturdays that would come together with, loads of different skills from fencing to jujitsu to judo um to kenjutsu like all kinds of different weapon skills that we could all mash together and then figure out what worked under different kinds of pressure whether it be um because i'm sure like if you go through the videos you'll see like we were training in the snow we trained in the ice we trained in riverbeds yeah. uh we trained everywhere we trained at nighttime we did all kinds of variables for our fighting to see where techniques would fail and what we could add to them from somewhere yeah, else and yeah. and fma always had cool shit it was always yeah, like yeah. To, to, play to, this technique or yeah, this technique yeah. there was always something we could draw from it that uh and i think that's what one of those things that just kept me coming back you know year after year to, to learn more yeah. fma here let's, speaking of training in the environment let's show the folks this and you can kind of run us through Oh, yeah. So what's going on? You guys are in the water. What, what's the... Uh, it's this is this is. Uh, it looks like a really like warm tropical day. It's it's real quiet. Or sorry, it's it's real cold water. Um, this is uh, like as far as it. This is the Pacific Ocean up where we live. So this is actually a little bit cold for most people, but to the right amount of training. Yeah, your body adapts so what we're doing is we're doing a couple of things at once we're working on um, our ability to stay in the water for long periods of time you know 20 minutes to half an hour 45 minutes in the period. and at the same time we're working on what you see as rock running so we get a rock that's heavy enough to drop us to the bottom we hold it out front hold our breath and go for as long runs as possible working on expanding our, our lung capacity under the pressure of the ocean but also under the duress of, of something that scares a lot of people, you know, swimming in a spot like this where there's whales and all kinds of little creatures. Um, and then on top of that, we're doing a bit of uh, what we call the Drake Drill. So after we get out of the cold water, our body's frozen, we gotta warm up. One of the things that we do to warm up um, is this, it's a hand fighting pummeling drill that we, uh, that we adapted to, um, yeah, to this environment. You can see where we're standing is, really uneven rocks it's kind of a sandy kind of a sandy little hill that's on the side of the ocean there um and we go through like we warm up first working on hand control wrist control we go to bicep control mm -hmm. bicep control and then we go to underhooks and we go to clinch and then after a few minutes of just kind of warming up through those flows then we go into a more of a freestyle play which is what's in the video and that's trying to gain dominant control over the person's center line and center mass so that theoretically you could set up other things, whether it be taking their kazushi, so pulling them off of balance, setting up our own kazushi, or developing, you know, maybe a side uh, side arm drag so I can grab my knife. Um, there's, yeah, there's quite a few different things kind of all happening in that drill. But what that basically a video represents is um, one of the mornings that me and a group of friends would get together and express our training. You know, we're uh, drinking wild medicine teas out of bulk help cups that we've made at the same time, swimming as far as we can or as deep as we can, just trying to expand ourselves physically, emotionally, and uh, yeah, and spiritually, really. Because like swimming out in a space where you might run into a whale can yeah, be a bit much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then get out while you're freezing your hands don't work yeah. and doing some sort of pummel drill or doing some sort of knife drill like we'll throw on the goggles and bust out the cert knives and do a few minutes of knife sparring yeah um, that's awesome um where, actually which is a perfect segue to um your whole thing like i mean obviously you're really in touch with nature like how like for the folks who are watching like 
how can it, you know like for the practitioners whether fma or not but your whole thing on the wild foods and the medicine like um is there a benefit for us practitioners to look into that experiment with that and all that i uh, yeah I, I really think so i mean you know for for me i got into wild medicine i went to school for herbal medicine in 2009 mm. um and then i ended up studying pardon me I ended up studying directly under a number of different amazing mycologists uh, as far as uh, herbal medicine and mushrooms. And then I also ended up working in a mushroom lab and all that kind of gave me a glimpse of health that I didn't know was possible before, you know, whenever, when I was kickboxing and doing MMA before that, um, if something got hurt, I would maybe have like an Epsom salt bath or something like that, you know, Um, or I'd rub some salve on it, but I didn't really understand how, I didn't understand how it all worked. And, you know, the more and more I started training martial arts with Frank, because Frank's coming from this ninjutsu background, which mm-hmm. has an 18 skill set, right? Like it's not just punch, kick, stab, smash. It's, you know, understanding what's going on with the stars so you can navigate, understanding mm-hmm. what's going on with the clouds so you can use, um, if it's just me and you, and we got to get this village of people, and it's just the two of us. If we understand the wind direction, we can make a fire with um, an intoxicating or poisonous chemical and have the wind blow that into the village. Oh, okay. That, okay. Will help, that will help our martial arts. And so the 18 skill sets incorporates all these different things to allow you to have better control of the outcome of whatever your goal is. Mm. Um, because of that heavy emphasis with Frank, um, it pushed me to learn that much more about wild foods, that much more about how to use them for healing. Okay. And because his training was brutal, like his, his first art was, was uh, Kyokushin karate. So no pads, yeah, lots heard. of punching yeah. and hurting each other. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I that's like and I was coming from Muay Thai. Yeah, I came from Muay Thai where we wear shin pads and gloves. Like yeah, it was, you know, where he was, he had me in the winter punching trees, you know, it was totally different. And so I needed to heal in order to make sure that I could get out there and train with them. Um, Cause everything too, is that Frank lived uh, in, um, he lived in very wild conditions. You know, right now he lives in a hut that he's made out of material he found on the side of a mountain in the snow okay. line. And, um, that so when I go to train with him, it's like I am sleeping out somewhere in the wild, you know, and I have to get up, punch, kick, smash, and then go back and sleep on this hard ground. If I'm not mm. healing fast, I'm gonna hurt really bad every day. Yeah, That's yeah, gonna hinder my ability yeah. to that much more. Okay. So for me, the emphasis on wild foods is allowing me to keep training at a high hard pace even if it's even if i'm just doing a ton of yin work you know just crazy amounts of yin work i'll still get sore and tired if i'm sleeping on the hard ground night after night for a week um and frank has this thing called the kangago which is our winter training it's nine hours for nine days and those those nine hours sometimes are in the middle of the night so learning more and more about wild foods would allow me to then uh, affect my energy levels my ability to uptake information really well, even when I was super tired and I really beat up and adrenalized. Um, so there's a number of different components that I would say for a martial artist that's serious about their martial arts um, could, could take from wild foods. But I would also go as far as saying that every human being on the planet that has been born within the environment of this global sphere should be taking some wild foods into their diet because our body knows that stuff. You know, you think about how long we've been eating uh, fancy prima strada pizza. It's like it's a blip in our existence yeah. where the amount of time we've been eating the wild plants, the wild animals, drinking out of the streams, our body knows that information and has for hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah. So it allows it to uptake that information in a completely different way. So it's that's, I mean, the skinny and the short. It just allows us to kind of live a, a bigger, broader experience with less um, less injury and, and less hardship, maybe. 
No, that's awesome. How could people that maybe from this interview that watch in now or later, how, I mean, what would be a good source of information if they wanted to tap further into this? Well, I've got, um, I've got a, I've got a company that I'm piggybacking on, um, called, I think it's Tertia online. Um, yeah, it's yeah. www.tertiaonline.com. This is uh, Chris Mandigba's um, Tertia Canada. He's also a really rad cat. You should interview. Very cool guy. His name, yeah, his um, name. He's in Ottawa. Too. Yeah, very cool guy. I really like him. Um, but again, yeah, he's he's allowed me to piggyback my um, we call it the five pillars of survival. Okay, and that's and www. That's on his dot com. Yeah, I'm just gonna check just to be sure, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Okay. Um, but that that is a that's a, a program that we've set up that is. Um, Sorry, I'm just typing it in. That is a, a subscription-based program. Okay. So, so you can go in there and learn a number of these different skills that we just talked about, plus a crazy amount more for, I think it's like 20 bucks a month. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's uh, tertiaonline.com. Um, Tertia he's uh, He's got a, a whole bunch of other stuff on here. It's the Tertia Training Academy. Um, okay. It's got quite a few other programs available in his store, but all all really worth tech checking out. Um, okay. So yeah, so my programs on there as the LOS strategies uh, five pillars of survival, um, and it's yeah, I'd say it's worth checking out because we go over a lot of different plants, trees, mushrooms, um, shelter. Basically, we go through the five pillars, which is food, fire, water, shelter, security, and then expand on each of those elements. Um, awesome. One of the yeah, things that yeah. I always come back to is, yeah. yeah, it's worth checking out. It's I, I like to expand concepts. Masashi said, um, take big concepts, make them small. Take little concepts, make them big. You know, and mm -hmm. within the five pillars, I'm always trying to figure out like, what is another way that I can survive a situation with less? You know, yeah. like if I have a bag, mental bag full of a lot of skills, it means when I go into the urban environment or the wilderness environment, I take less physical objects with me. Right. So right, if I want right. to hike a really big distance, the more, the more knowledge I have, the smaller backpack I carry. And it's, you know, there's a big emphasis that with my five players survival, because you don't like, I know for myself, I like to hike and anything over 20 pounds worth of gear it gets kind of be annoying after a while, even yeah, if you had a great oh, path. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, if I can reduce it down to down to a minimal amount of gear, but still be able to accomplish a shit ton of goals simply because yeah. of the stuff I've learned, this makes way more sense. No, this is fascinating. Yeah, this is why I, I'm hoping people take advantage of this, you know, and incorporate. Wow, wow. So, uh, what? Okay, so what are you? Um, you know, future goals for you. I mean, what are your what are your future goals in in your journey and all that? Uh, you know, that's I I, I want to keep I'm gonna keep plugging on. You know, I want to I want to learn as much as I absolutely can, and I want to share as much as I can before I die, and then I want to have a good death. Yeah, those are I think those are my primary goals really. That's awesome. Um, and along along that time, I want to have a, I want to have fun. Yeah. I want to play and meet more people and have fun. Yeah. It sounds like you're doing it. <laughs> what, uh, what, you know, as, as, as a whole, for FMA community as a whole, what, I mean, what would you like to see improvements in our community? Oh, you know, <laughs> we kind of touched on that earlier, yeah. you know, as far as I'd like to see more people getting along. And I know that's like kind of almost cliche, but we just have so much more fun. Like, even if you don't like Bob, Doug, so and so, it's like go to a thing where he's stick fighting and stick fight with him. You'll be friends after, you know. Like yeah, maybe just get I've had to do some with each other, and yeah, yeah. Find that mutual that mutual point of respect. You know, it's like um, too often we're taught to look at situations and see the difference. And I think that in FMA we should look at everything and see what's the same. There's definitely more um, commonality for sure. 
for sure. Yeah. So much. Like there's like the the martial art that Frank taught me, um, the nin, the type of ninjutsu is Shizen Dan Ryu, mm -hmm. and it is a martial art of principles. We don't teach techniques. We teach principles and then build on those principles with a multitude of techniques. And as soon as I got to FMA, I was just blown away by how everything was the same. <laughs> I was like, holy yeah, so heck. Yeah, it's just it's all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It's totally more commonality than differences. I mean, one of really them. Yeah. That's right. And there'll be, you know, there'll be slight variations in range and timing and angles, yeah, but yeah. It, it's the same stuff. And because of that, I think that if we could, if we could look at it more that way and see what connects us instead of what divides us, I think we'd have more fun. Um, I would like to see more, like we were, you guys talked a little bit last night about different sparring games. I would love to see more games that people are comfortable playing being played. Instead yeah. of arguing about stuff that they don't need to argue about, they could just share. Because oh, you know, like even if I was even if I was too old to get hit with a stick, um, which I know may happen, if that happens, I'm still gonna find a way to play a game to share my principles and share my attributes with my Absolutely. students. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I'd love to see more of that, you know? Yeah. And, and more potlucks. More more potlucks. I like stick fighting potlucks I, that is the coolest shit on the planet you know yeah. the hen keeling guys they get together after class and eat but then once a year they get all their groups together and they have a big potluck and they stick fight and it is the best time ever like yeah. it's so that much fun. fun that does sound fun wow wow man this has been absolutely a wonderful interview um i just hope people you know watch it you know not that but just all the stuff that you brought into, especially on, you know, on the wild foods and the nature, um, you know, just your journey traveling around the world and, you know, just wow, 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 wow. You know, I knew this, this would be enjoyable. Um, social I'm really, glad we got to I'm really glad we got to connect. I, uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah, same here. Yeah, yeah same here. Um, for folks that like want to, you know, follow you up and pursue it, I got YouTube is uh, L -O -L dot o dot S dot strategy for YouTube yep. channel. And then the Victoria martial arts uh, website. And of course they can uh, reach you obviously via messenger, right? I'm on here. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Messenger, Instagram, um, any of those components I, I definitely reply to. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Man, well, this has been an absolute pleasure, Darcy. Uh, you're one of the, you're one of the many, you know, that after, after doing these interviews, I would, you know, one day I would, you know, obviously love to meet and all that. Um, you know, that's a, you know, all that. So, but uh, hopefully, when COVID, uh, what's it, you know, what's the current status quo? Americans can't come into Canada, or what's what's status quo? I don't know. I don't yeah, know. I see Americans. I'm wondering. I see American cars up here all the time. And I oh, see, yeah. I see American tourists. I mean, so maybe, maybe they have to be, yeah. but they have to be vaccinated. I'm sure that's. Let me know because you're always welcome. We'll find. We'll we'll make we'll make time for training. If I wasn't vaccinated, could you guys smuggle me in? Yeah, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> Put myself in a uh, box and a UPS and be delivered. That's right. <laughs> Don't check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't open that box. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, hey, don't be a stranger. Post your stuff on FMA discussion and all that. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I think people should post your stuff about the, well, I don't know. I think people should hear more about you. You know what I mean? So, you know, by all means, I mean, feel free to post an FMA discussion. Yeah. I appreciate that a lot. You know, um, this is another reason why I love FMA is it as much as that there has been some division between people, mm -hmm. I find that everybody I've met has always been so welcoming. Everybody is, yeah. you know, it's like, even though there's like this squabbling, it's not really, it's more still a big family. I, yeah, I, I think them. at the end of the day, there's obviously, there's really good people in our community that then the majority are, are, it's, you know, you, you got the few bad apples that, uh, yeah, but I think so. The majority are good and, and all that. 100%. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, but man, I want to appreciate you. I hope we didn't take you because we're going up on close to two hours. Wow. 
Uh, holy heck, I hope uh, we didn't take you away from the family or uh, and all that. <laughs> we're, making, we're making a pancake breakfast, actually, getting ready for a day of foraging wild foods. Wow, oh, there you go. There you go. That's, so, man, so you got the, you got some little ones running around there? Yeah. There is yeah, there's the there's a couple. There's a uh, Atlas. Atlas is about a year and CL's thirteen. Um yeah, there's I think there's six I think there's five or six of us in the house today. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. at times at times we have a full house. A couple weeks ago we had I think there was like I think there was twelve of us in the house at one point. Oh man, awesome, awesome, yeah. awesome. <laughs> but uh well, hey, you, you enjoy the rest of your weekend, and uh, please, please take me up, take me up on that. You know, post your stuff in the FMA discussion. You know what I mean? I think people should. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate this chance to have a chat. Oh my God, yeah. So what I'm gonna do is I download it YouTube, and of course I'll uh, I'll post it to your wall once it's downloaded and everything for sure. You know. Okay, awesome. awesome. All right, man. Well, hey, you take care of yourself. All right. <laughs> yeah. Good to meet you, sir. Absolutely. You know, you take care and. Uh, yeah, hopefully it won't be the last we hear from you, you know? No, definitely not. Definitely not. Hey, you know what? Here's a thought. You and that Frank guy could come back on. Oh, I would pay him. I would pay him to come and interview and do something. I will talk to him. I will, I will, I will, I'd bring it up to him, but he is such a I hard know. cookie. Thing, talk to him and just, just let him know that you would be there with him. You guys could be share the same room. He hasn't do he hasn't do, he hasn't had to do anything technical. He just needs to sit by you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I would I really would love to get him out, man. He is because he's he's never had a regular job like us. He's never had the kinds of responsibilities we've had. So he's studied and he is trained in a way that I don't know another person on the planet does. Wow. Uh, he is um, a philosophical yeah. genius. Tell him people could benefit. Him. Yeah, see if he. Yeah, talk to him. He wants to come on. If he wants to come on, we'll make it happen. We could put you both in this yeah. thing room and they could just share stuff. <laughs> oh, love that. Yeah. Let me know. Talk to him. Let me know and uh, yeah, let me know. We'll make it happen. If he's if he's interested, we'll make it happen. Yeah, yeah definitely. I'll bring it up to him. I got three. Paulo gave me three questions to ask him the last time I saw him in person. And yeah, it was, he was like, can you record them? And I tried to record him answering the questions, but he wouldn't even, he, he, <laughs> he, he wasn't, wouldn't he do wasn't it. even entertaining that. Okay. Well, you no, have to work on I got like, I got 11 minutes of video of him doing the Tai Chi class last week or a couple weeks ago. And that's the most video I think yeah. I've ever had of him ever. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I'll definitely bring it up to him. Cause yeah, you know, like no. the thing is, He's got the kind of wisdom that a lot of people can learn from. That's what I mean. Tell him there's an audience out there that could benefit from him and wants to hear from him. See what he does. Yeah, see what he says. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. That would be, be cool. All right. Let me know on that. Yeah, definitely. And uh, in the meantime, you take care of yourself and uh, don't be a stranger. Yeah, thank you. Take care. All right. All right. You have a good day, man. Take care. All right. All right, that wraps up uh, episode 199. Wow, that was interesting, especially on the other stuff that normally does not get covered on here, uh, nature and all that, and how they can benefit your training and longevity of life. So uh, who is next? Um, I think a theme episode Tuesday. Yeah. So again, if you haven't already, hit subscribe to FMA Discussion, where we uh, donate all our money from being monetized to a charity. Okay, so you'll be helping us help others. All right, all. Take care and see you next time.